So first and foremost, I am the other type of oncologist. I am the psycho-oncologist, which does sound slightly concerning. Um, it does not mean a psychotic oncologist. This is someone who specializes in the psychology, which is greater than just thoughts and feelings, behaviors and emotions. This is the wider umbrella of distress. And it's not just for the patient, it's for the family, it's for the extended family, the grandchildren. So my domain is the psycho-oncology realm, particularly today in melanoma. So you've had so much information today, you're probably at capacity. So if you can only remember one thing from me today and you forget everything else, can you please remember that you're on an emotional roller coaster? You didn't want to be on this ride. If you had any choice, you would be nowhere near us. Granted, I'm grateful you're here, right here tonight. But in the realm of oncology, if you had a choice, you wouldn't be here. Unfortunately, here we are. So remembering this is a roller coaster of emotions, and I will call this very normal. This does not mean it's nice. The emotions we experience on this roller coaster are intense, they are difficult, and while I'm calling them normal, please know that they're not nice. Today, my goal is to fly through relatively quickly four areas. I'm going to expand on this emotional roller coaster. I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit about information. We're going to talk about friends and family, and then we're going to talk about the help that's available. But I'm quite a chatty person, and we are running a little over time, so I will try and speed things through so I don't keep you here all night. So first and foremost, people will often ask, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? How are you feeling? And you'll get this question on repeat. No matter how you are feeling, believe it or not, it's okay. You might find that you're actually okay on that particular moment and someone is really pushing you for an answer. Are you really sure you're okay? Really? Are you doing all right? This can get exhausting and tiring. At the other end of the continuum, you might have constant thoughts about the future or what's happening. Regardless, whatever you are feeling is okay. It's not nice, but it's okay. There are lots of things we can do. Understand that this roller coaster will cover everything and it will be going for a very long time. I'd love to be able to say you could just hop off that ride. But like Julie mentioned to start with, it's the survivorship. Okay, um, right, well, what does that mean now? What am I up to? What's happening? What is really happening with the future? We see beautiful graphs from our medical oncologist, but there might be one or two things that we focus in on. Maybe it was a little purple section or the little dots, or perhaps these numbers that pick up your attention that are not the best news that we would like to see. Understand that our brain is primed to look for threat. And what is more threatening than a diagnosis of cancer? It threatens your survival like nothing else. It turns your life upside down. Hence, while you are on this roller coaster, everything is swirling around you. The other thing that happens is that your sense of self, so who you are as an individual, gets challenged. In fact, it gets threatened. We had a lovely um, picture of side effects up there, and oh my goodness, there were so many. But the one that I talk to people about so often is fatigue. How tired, how fatigued people are. This can rob you of things that you would typically like doing. Now, understandably, this makes you feel low, anxious, sad, insert emotion. We will all have these experiences when our life changes so significantly. So, in amongst these two big threats to survival and also to our sense of self, we've got the number one, anxiety, associated with uncertainty. In my world, in the world of psycho-oncology, we have a special kind of anxiety. It's just in our world. It's called the fear of cancer recurrence and progression. It's so prevalent, we actually have a specific name and diagnostic criteria for it. We expect to see between 20 and 66% of people coming through with this. And granted, humanity is on a continuum, so it might not necessarily be severe, but it's there. It can happen at any time. It can happen at the point of diagnosis. It can happen when you finish treatment. It can happen in the middle of immunotherapy. The thing is, is that this roller coaster is going to take a lot of energy from you. And I feel like I'm probably preaching to the converted because you've all probably experienced this to some extent. So the thing about mood and anxiety is that we know that there's a greater prevalence of having some of these concerns if you've experienced them in the past. This doesn't mean you're doomed. This is just a fact. If you have had an experience with low mood or with anxiety, you are more likely to experience these during this roller coaster ride. 
And I think the last thing to point out in the realm of emotion is that the distress doesn't stop once you know what's going on with treatment. Okay, I've got surgery first, and then I'm doing some immunotherapy, or I might have a little bit of radiotherapy in there as well. Your distress can keep going. It can keep going when you get triggered by something. It could be even triggered by something discussed tonight. You came for information, and all of a sudden there's something up there that your brain's latched onto and thought, ooh, I don't like that very much. That's a normal experience. It's not nice, but it is understandable. So knowing that the distress curve of when you're going to experience these emotional highs and lows, we can point out particular heightened areas of concern. So it is diagnosis. It actually is not just starting treatment, but it's finishing treatment as well. Suddenly there are not so many checkups. Who's really looking out for me? What's going on? Having bloods taken, but not really knowing what those results are because no one's rung. Or they ring on a Friday night at five o'clock. Oh yes, got to see you next week. Well, you've got the whole weekend to sit there and worry. So understand the roller coaster is real. Information. We've, talk, we've heard about Dr. Google. Oh my goodness. I talk about Dr. Google all the time. I try and encourage patients to hone in their Googling to reliable sources of information. But most often than not, people have already Googled prior to coming to see me. So they're, like everything in humanity, it's on a continuum. Some people do a lot of research and some people don't want any information. Now, as you are sitting here tonight, I'm going to say you might be in this middle realm looking for that information. It's important we get the information from a reliable source. Now, Melanoma Institute, MPA and Cancer Council have got exceptional resources. These are really good. My heart sank when Julie mentioned that Brent and Daniel got given information about breast cancer at the point of their diagnosis. Like I hear interesting things all the time from my clients and a few things will make my stomach drop, but nothing ever prepares me to hear those stories. Getting information on breast cancer, I mean, we even know the breast cancer prevalence in men is lower than women, so I mean, we're still not even gender specific there. It's entirely inappropriate. So we have to make sure that we are arming ourselves with the right information, but also at the right time. You may not necessarily be able to understand everything that's being said, which was so beautifully highlighted by Mark. You are given information. It begins to set in, and then it's literally like trying to Google when you've got no Wi-Fi. Nothing is being taken on board. You cannot compute information that's being presented to you. It is a fabulous idea to have someone writing things down. It will be very hard to try and write and listen at the same time in this situation. I even encourage patients to take along their phone, turn on the voice memo, always check with your doctor that you can do this, um, and always offer to send them a copy of this as well. But so you can retain the information because you absolutely categorically won't remember everything. And you may take away information and think, oh, actually I'm stage two or I'm a stage one. This is very, very common. So really, I encourage people to get crafty and creative about taking on board this information. And of course, when it's time to go to appointments, the anxiety and the nerves about going is going to mean that you're not going to be able to remember all your questions. Remember, normal, not nice. So please write them down before you go. It's totally okay to pull out a list. If your list is very long, it might be useful to maybe email it through first so that the doctor might choose a couple to answer for you. So it's always a good idea to be pre-prepared for these appointments. And of course, there's information overload. This comes back to Dr. Google too. There is a lot of information out there that is wrong, that has just come from absolutely nowhere. Anyone can write anything on the internet. You don't need to be a doctor. Or you might be a doctor of colour therapy and you're talking about the benefits of a, an avocado stone being dried up and then put into a smoothie. P.S. don't do that. There's, there's no benefits at this point. So the thing is that people will tell you this. They will come up and they will try and give you hints or tips or tricks. They're trying so hard to be helpful. They're not necessarily getting that information across in the best way. And the avocado seed story was actually something that happened for a patient. Um, so when we think about what do we tell family, how do we tell children, the information that you provide is determined by what you want to provide. There is no right or there is no wrong. However, having said that, 
When we talk about sharing information with children or grandchildren, honesty is the best policy. Believe it or not, they're very smart, smart and they can understand if there's something happening underneath. If everyone's saying, no, no, everything's fine, and then there's parents upset and there's grandparents crying, something is not fine, so they get very confused. The thing is, when talking about sharing information, I like to give the analogy of a ravine or a valley, which is quite deep. So if you think about right down on the valley floor, this is all the detail and information. If we think about the top of the mountains, this is our sort of lower level of information. And you are a helicopter pilot. So you can drive along and decide, because your helicopter goes in all directions, you can dip down and decide how much information are you going to give this person. Are you going to fly your helicopter to the bottom of the ravine and see all of the details of this valley? Or are you just going to coast over the top and say, oh yes, look, you know, there's a river, this is, you know, a green patch over here, and this is where I'm ending up. You get to decide how much information you give, and it's entirely up to you. With regards to resources for children, there are some fabulous apps, actually, believe it or not, uh, particularly for younger children. So there's great resources from the Cancer Council for older children, but if you're looking at sort of the 5 to 12, uh, the Kids Guide to Cancer is an app, and it has cartoons and little movies that are totally age appropriate that you can have a look through. I guess the other thing is that when you're at the beginning of a new part of treatment or you've just got your diagnosis, people are going to be absolutely hounding you for information. Sometimes it can be useful to have a communication strategy manager, literally. You have one person that rules all the communication. So it can be a partner, it can be a family member, it can be a friend, and they can update everybody else because it can get very overwhelming if people are constantly asking what's happening, what's happening, and you've got to send 15 of the same messages. So communication manager is helpful. And then, as I've sort of touched on, there will be unhelpful comments that come your way. It's not if, it's going to be when. And I really had a bit of a giggle about the lasagna comment. I can't tell you how many patients are like, I'm so sick of getting lasagnas. I had one family who had literally a little sign at the door, please no lasagna, thank you, because that's all they ever got. So it's so important to be able to figure out a way of communicating your needs around what your family needs in terms of support. And again, there are apps and resources online that you can actually produce a calendar or a schedule so people know what they can do to help you out. Help. Now, in every major cancer hospital, there is a psycho-oncology team with people like me. In private hospitals, there is likely to be a link to someone in the community if there's not someone in that centre as well. And of course, we've got, as we've heard today, MPA and Cancer Council with these support systems ready to go. I have a clinic upstairs. I have lots of colleagues. We meet every two months and we have a psychologist and oncology meeting. Um, it's not quite as exciting as the meeting that happens here on a Friday morning. That's far more interesting to watch all the different disciplines battle it out. But we network and we have large links to other states, So we're uh, particularly in research as well, so with I uh, Iris starting our research arm here. So the key thing is that there are links, and if you're not sure of where to go or if there's a psychologist in an area near you, do reach out. We are more than happy to link you to someone in the community who has got the skills in this particular field. While I would love to say that any psychologist would be useful, it may or may not be the case. The thing about psycho-oncology is that there are skills which we teach and we share with patients that perhaps are not standard skills. So one of the main techniques in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is challenging the validity of a thought. So basically, is your thought true or not? So let's say you've got a phobia of dogs. If you have recurring thoughts about, oh, that dog might bite me and give me rabies, the likelihood of being bitten and getting rabies is relatively low. We can challenge the validity of that thought. If your thought is, I'm really worried my cancer's going to come back, no one should ever challenge the validity of that thought because we haven't got that crystal ball to look into, even though we've got Richard with his crystal ball predicting the future through cellular structure. The thing is, we don't actually 100% know what's happening. So we've got to be able to tweak some of our psychological techniques when sharing with patients who are navigating an oncology journey. So regardless of what you feel, it is never inappropriate to reach out and ask for help. More than half of patients who enter this world or get on this roller coaster ride will need 
psychological help. You don't have to go for years. You can dip in, see someone for a short period of time, and then stretch that space out. You don't need to go every week. Often most of my patients don't come every week because they've got other things going on, like immunotherapy or they're going for surgery. It is a busy time. Being a patient is a full-time job. So making sure you're looking after yourself and your family is absolutely vital. And so that concludes my very speedy welcome to the world of psycho-oncology.